Welcome again, everybody. Um, I think every, everyone was here in the first one. Yeah. And so now I'm going to present another part, but in the same <coughs> line of my uh, thesis, uh, that's uh, not only for neuropsychiatry, not from emotional uh, outcomes from uh, or life stress, but also cognition and how uh, social isolation and neglect can influence the episodic explicit memory. So the first thing, uh, we already talked about it, uh, it's the early life stress uh, and has been related to the development of emotional but also cognitive disturbance <coughs> later in life. And from this, uh, for this um, kinds of uh, early life stress, we are going to focus on neglect now. So uh, these factors, their life stress, have important neuro neurobiological implications in brain areas such as uh, HPA axis and brain limbic areas. But these areas are not responsible only for emotional, but our, also for cognitive uh, at all. Uh, and they, they, there are some tests that are kind of independent from emotional uh, emotionality. So uh, at, for instance, uh, episodic speech to memory tests. So if you look for some brain areas um, that are related, sorry, there is some problem there. Uh, uh, there, is a, there are some areas in the brain responsible from, uh, for memory tasks, and it will be depend on the kind of memory you're talking about. If you are talking about uh, uh, working memory or uh, long-term memory in such a, how can you, uh, use this information to, as, uh, for instance, to uh, do a talk, as I'm doing now, we use the prefrontal cortex. Uh, also, the hippocampus is uh, for the short-term memory, and also to consolidate this short-term information into long-term memory information. And regarding the emotional memory, or implicit memory, you have the participation of amygdala as well. and the, if you look to types of memory, you have this uh, immediate memory, you have the short-term memory, and the long-term memory. And the long-term memory can be divided in explicit or declarative one, and implicit or non-declarative. So for each one, we have different brain areas. Uh, implicit or non-declarative memory uh, includes the procedural memory, emotional reactivity, stimulus reactivity. In the other side, we have the explicit or declarative memory that can be divided into semantic or episodic. And the semantic is mainly the concepts that you have about the things you know. And the episodic is more uh, linked to facts and places that you know. So this presentation is going to be focused on this episodic declarative memory. So here, yeah, the figure has some problem, but uh, it's enough to us uh, to understand how uh, the memory can be different, different tasks in our life and different kind of, uh, kinds of memories. In the top part, the guy is remember that yesterday they, uh, he had uh, a class for gymnastics and uh, he can remember this fact when happened, what happened in the time and the space. And the middle we have uh, an example for semantic memory. If I ask you what is a library is, you know what is this, it's a concept. It's not, you don't have to remember when you were in the library. It's just, you know what is it. And the third one is the procedural memory. If I take on a computer here and ask you for using this, you can do it. You don't have to remember, you don't have to, of course you, you, you use a concept of computer to know, know how to use it, but you just do. So it's a procedural memory. And Talking more specifically for explicit episodic memory, we have some uh, uh, daily uh, tasks like what you, do you remember what did you have for lunch yesterday? This is explicit memory, episodic memory. What's the color of the slide back? Who, who remembers? Green. Green, yeah, <coughs> this is episodic memory. Uh, in uh, Just to, to be more specific in the concept is not uh, when you remember that it's green. This is 
one minute ago, but this is uh, long term memory, it's not short term memory anymore. So this is why it's uh, episodic memory. The other thing, uh, where you were in September 11th, do you remember this, is a fact, yeah. And I've seen this person before, phenomena, this is a uh, explicit memory also. And when you uh, have your head cut the last time, it's still uh, explicit memory. So theoretically, they are independent from emotion, but we know it's not this way. But for sure, we have uh, tasks that are really dependent from the memory, and the other one as how when you uh, learn in math, for instance, it's not so uh, dependent directly for emotional status. And here we have a, some a sample again of some papers recent published about this uh, relation between early life stress, but now uh, not emotional outcomes, but cognitive outcomes. And uh, neurobiological finds in this area regarding memory. Uh, yeah, and also in, in basic <coughs> research, we have this uh, amazing number of, of papers published in this area regarding memory and explicit memory uh, specifically. So for this, uh, it's a really recent paper, I think it's the same that the other that I showed you before. It's regarding uh, not only um, a structural uh, difference or influence in the brain, but also the functional of this. And in the brain, you know, we have the excitatory system and inhibitory system in the same cell, in the same areas, and now we are talking about a disbalance between this for, uh, as a consequence for uh, early, life, or early life stress in the, in, the, in the behavior in the late uh, life. So this is probably is the basis of cognitive impairment. So today I am going to present you uh, one animal model of this relationship between early life stress and uh, outcome for memory, impairment of memory. And the uh, aim here is evaluate the long-term consequence of a model called uh, neonatal social isolation that I'm going to say is all. Uh, it's an animal model of ELS, neglect, on the species episodic memory later in life. So the methods, uh, I have these all animals, I have rats, uh, with, that were individually isolated from postnatal day four to seven, six hours a day, while a control pups were left in the stubble. So here we have the red dam with the pups. I take one of these pups and keep it, uh, it isolated for a while. And then later in life, we test in the novel object recognition task. It's a task, cognitive task involving memory. Basically, the task is really simple. And in the training setup that lasts four days, we just show the rat two identical objects in a cage. So the rat has to explore, has no, he will do it. Explore the objects and we take in account how many time they spend doing uh, the exploration part of each object. In the testing setup, we just replace one of the objects for another one, different one. And as rats are so exploring animals, what we expect from them is they will recognize there is an, a new one. I mean, they will recognize the one of these objects they already know, so they will explore the other one more than the, the first known one. So here in the first phase, uh, in blue, we have the identical objects, and in red, we have the other object, the new one, that the rat wants to explore more. The first and second bars represents the first part of the training, when the rat's just exploring the objects, and as you can see, that dash line represents the uh, by chance amount of time they will uh, be spent in each object, 50%, because uh, there are two. And this, the third and fourth bar represents the testing setup. So as you can see, uh, the animal can explore much more the second, the new one, than the already known object. So this is to us is a measure of memory. This rat remember that 
yesterday the blue object was okay, but now there is another one. This is for the counter groups, no isolated reds. But when we isolate the reds, we see something different. In the two, these two, first bar here is the same of the counter one. They don't uh, explore less the object, they are not. Uh, Paying, not paying attention to the object, it's just go and explore as control. But in the second day, when we had, when we replace this one, this one object for another new one, what we see is there is no difference. The animal doesn't go to explore more this object. So to us, it's a, a measure of uh, an impairment in the memory. So here, just to show you the stats about it, it's the same graph just taking the control and isolation is an isolation group in the test session and as results we have these animals iso, iso animals and control they do not differ in relative really time exploring the objects it's not a problem of attention it's not a problem of uh, motor activity or interest in the objects uh, on the test, however, the control animals spent more relative time exploring the new object, while iso animals did not show this difference. To us, the, in, the iso animal doesn't recognize an, that object as a new one. And there are not significant differences between the groups in total amount of time exploring uh, objects in the sessions. Even in test sessions, they explore the same amount. And to us, uh, it suggests that ESO animals show a def deficit, deficit sorry, in discrimination between known and new stimulus, which could be interpreted as a explicit episodic memory impairment. I also propose that ELS is able to produce longer-term consequences. Do you remember these guys were, uh, were isolated from the mothers and from the others uh, between P and D, uh, 4 and 7, <coughs> and they were tested more than 100 days before, and they uh, keep this difference so far. Uh, so certainly uh, this difference certainly is mediated by structural and functional changes in the brain in the same areas that I show you. Uh, circuit is linked only, not only to emotional behavior but more specifically here cognition. For sure the hippocampus is implicated in this task. So what we as a conclusion is isolation cause memory impairment in these rats. So here we have a, a kind of a scam trying to show you the early life stress ages through neurobiological alteration and the behavioral outcomes are emotional disturbances and cognitive impairments as well, not only this. So we, uh, our aim is kind of to block this and stop this happening to our <coughs> children. Uh, so if we have this consistent in literature and also in our clinics when you, you see individuals and they have a history of uh, early life stress, really common to have uh, this kind of outcome, uh, especially while we are psychologists, uh, emotional disturbance, but also cognitive impairments. So it's really short. Thank you for your attention again, and I'm glad to have some questions.